Yeah, so I think we can just start and mm -hmm. go with it. Should mm -hmm. we do the clap? Yeah. Three, two, one. <claps> Woo! Rolling. Mm -hmm. Sanne Mona. Yes. Back in the studio for a second time. You were here something like a month ago, I think. And, um, you told me a little bit about your journey into skiing, about your life now, about living in Engelberg, and also your, I think, big dreams to make it onto the free ride world tour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really liked meeting you. And it was the first time we ever met. Like we had just, I don't know, linked up on uh, Instagram before that. And I went home and I was like stoked to have met you. But I also felt like I wanted to know more. And I didn't feel like satisfied um, mm -hmm. with our conversation in a lot of ways so I I asked you if you would come back and if we could go a little bit uh, deeper into your life and yeah. you agreed and and here we are <laughs> yeah it was probably good for me to to have one one rehearsal before yeah yeah I mean I think it's tough when you don't know each other at all beforehand and like I couldn't really have researched you either right it's not like you're super no. in the public world where I could have like googled and found out everything about your life and definitely not no so it was important to I think kind of like get a feel yeah. a feel for each other um since we met it started snowing now yeah in Engelberg and also yeah I don't know what would we say like maybe at 1700 meters we're starting to see a little bit of snowfall yeah um how has this sort of early season been for you how are you preparing for the winter what kind of things have you been up to so um yeah so yeah today i put on my winter shoes for the first time that was nice um it's mostly been raining then i'm just going around in my wellies but um preparing now i've actually been working quite a lot like since i've saw you i've been working mm -hmm. um quite a lot but normally This time of year, I'm uh, a lot uh, doing a lot of training. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's been um, I actually I think I came down with something just after I was here last time in October, and it stuck with me for quite a long time. So I haven't been preparing that much at all in the training, um, in the in the gym or on the training schedule. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit behind. But uh, yeah, normally now I go in and try to lift the big weights. Okay, so you, mm. I mean, I think something that's maybe important for me or for like the audience to get a feel for is like what that training looks like, because I mean, I know the world of like high performance sport mm. um, and certainly like free ride or freestyle skiing is obviously very intense, but mm -hmm. it is considered like this alternative sport mm -hmm. art or culture. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about like what kind of preparation goes into your season i mean that differs from person to person i think that's what's quite nice with the free ride uh, skiing it's not like a set uh, scheme that you have to do because you have to find something that fits you and your body mm -hmm. uh, i remember when i was um, before doing mogul skiing on a very high level we had kind of the same scheme for for everyone or the training all of the trainings with the coaches was kind of the same and it doesn't if it doesn't fit your body then you're mm. then you're always losing out and um uh, during the years after that career i was thinking quite a lot of what works for my body and what makes my body tick so these days i do quite a lot of uh, um dynamic training mm -hmm. explosive training um, I run a lot, mostly uphill, but also like flat, and uh, I lift weights mm -hmm. and try to focus on the muscle groups that I need, but still the whole body. That was actually one of the things that I saw during my uh, career in mogul skiing, that we were focusing so much on just the uh, thighs, mm -hmm. like in alpine racing. Mm -hmm. And that made my body very, very heavy and not agile. Like I wasn't fast enough because I couldn't, I couldn't be explosive because my, like I'm quite tall. So when I have these heavy muscles, I couldn't really get the, I couldn't get the power out of them because I wasn't agile enough. Mm -hmm. And then when I found that like running 
um, as a complementary to or like to f- I feed that into the training and then all of a sudden I became much more agile mm-hmm. so I kind of need a little bit more of that but that's just my I think it's just my body type mm-hmm. um, so I try to find training that makes me happy and um, feels good mm-hmm. yeah. yeah I mean I can relate to that also I'm just as tall as you mm. um, and for sure in the world of rowing like my sport background uh, we had a lot of women who were very good at putting on muscle mass mm. um, but then we would do like warm-up exercises and they'd be super strong like these girls could squat like gnarly numbers Mm -hmm. um but then we would do like agility ladders Mm. you know these ones where you have to jump in and out and like half the team was like lost yeah trying to um yeah to move quick feet and and all this stuff so that's fair and and good for you for for figuring that out yeah it wasn't by the help of the coaches though yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah i mean it's tough when you're in a system to go against what everyone else is doing or think think in a different way Mm -hmm. but now you're your own boss right yeah yeah which is nice yeah Mm. yeah (laughs) i was wondering are there other girls like either within your category and we talked a little bit about the like already for like this a and b or how how is it uh, divided again oh the uh, qualifier and the free ride Ah, um, uh, competition a challenger right or something like this yeah or you actually have it's a little bit more complicated now so in the free ride competition you have on top of the pyramid you have the free world tour Mm -hmm. so there there's um, eight uh, ski women Mm -hmm. so um, they are up there and they are competing against each other on their competitions yeah yeah and then you have uh, the qualifier which is uh, um, where i'm competing and also there you have different levels so you Mm -hmm. have the if we go from top down, you have the four star competitions, and oh, then yeah. you have the three star, two star, and one star. Um, and within the four star, you you could say four star, three star, you, um, you collect points. So you collect these points during the first part of the season. So during the first five competitions, I think it is now, to get into the challenger, mm-hmm. which is the last three competitions. Mm-hmm. And the persons uh, from the top of the pyramids who are seeded out after their first three competitions, so it's about six girls who who continue. They have a then uh, they continue to the next year, and there's two persons or four persons who goes out. Mm-hmm. They come down and compete with us on the challenger. So you'll have girls from last season that were in the pro tour competing with you now in challenger actually right? no actually it's the se- the girls from that season who comes down and they're not allowed to compete on the last two competitions that they should have oh. so so it's the same season always okay so they can kind of see themselves in by winning the challengers mm-hmm. so then they've done one year of the or one season of the world tour or half a season then they get down to um challenger mm-hmm. where we are and then uh, they could see themselves in mm-hmm. if they want to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some actually quit. Okay. Yeah. Because they've been like yeah downgraded like, ah. kind of yeah yeah. Okay. They're done. But so are these girls like either the ones within the challenger or in the the pro tour? Do they do kind of like summer training camps on the snow somewhere? Is that something you ever considered? Mm, yeah, some some do. Not many totally depends on your budget actually Mm -hmm. but most no most no a very low percentage yeah go to new zealand okay okay yeah and you could compete in new zealand if you want to i could come my season starts in august if i want to so then i would start and do two competitions in new zealand which i've done once Mm -hmm. and then go and then wait until january Mm -hmm. for the rest yeah, I mean, I'm curious because in a lot of sports, it feels like the off season is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, I mean, in ski racing, you go on the glaciers mm-hmm. or um, in rowing, people train throughout the winter. So I was wondering with like in these kind of more alternative sports, if it is more accepted to take time off or have that off season or what the kind of yeah vibe is around that. 
Yeah, I mean, and also, yeah, it is, it is off season because in free ride you need to be outside of the piece, so you don't have the possibility to go on yeah. handmade piece. So you would have to go to Argentina or like the south mm-hmm. hemisphere mm-hmm. just to go skiing, and that means that you would have to be a pro, otherwise you don't have the money, mm-hmm. or you need to have very rich parents yeah <laughs> you know or sponsors who would sponsor you for a year's salary kind of yeah and uh, at this time it's very few in free riding that have that opportunity okay mm. okay yeah hmm. and so you throughout the summer now this past summer you continued your job which you're working uh like also 80 percent or what i've done the last two years i've done 60 then this summer i've actually done 100 since june okay okay uh, or may yeah, yeah so now we've done 100 okay. which is very unusual for me okay. but i'm going down to 60 again. okay mm. okay so that's very much kind of the norm even for people i mean we can say you're kind of within that top 15 of the world right Mm -hmm. yeah in the sport Mm. um so it's pretty normal for people who are in the top 15 to have to really balance out their careers with a second career yeah next to that i would say i mean now i'm quite old (laughs) um if i compare to to the persons that i am competing against Mm -hmm. and i think that most of them are working quite hard during the summers and then taking off. Yeah. So they're not yet on like a career path mm-hmm. or they're studying at the same time. They're a little bit in another, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, part of their lives, um, which I'm not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a little bit different. Depends a little bit. The, the girls who are, yeah, if we talk about the girls, the girls that are my age um, do juggle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Something we talked about last time uh, was also like some of the skills you were able to carry over from mogul skiing, for example, like you talked about being really good on hard kind of crappy conditions that mm-hmm. maybe most people wouldn't prefer mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, off piste skiing. Um, and you kind of spoke about it more from like that sort of technical element. Mm. I was wondering if up until kind of now in your life the sport taught you something about yourself whether it have been like the mogul skiing or now um this free ride journey what have you learned about myself um oh this must be so much i mean it's impacted my whole being Hmm. for so many years that i think i i don't know the in and out so what if what it has actually mm-hmm. done for me as a person mm-hmm. uh, or with me as a person. <laughs> I don't know if it's age or if it's the skiing, but grit is something that I've learned mm-hmm. to have. Or can you say that you've learned to have grit? Yeah. In the beginning of my life, I had a lot of talent, uh, which is super important when you uh, when you do like something but, or start something so that it's quite fun in the beginning that you feel that it's um, it's something you really want to do. It's a little bit easier if you have the talent, so it's easy. But in the end, the the grit wins over talent any day. Hmm. And that's something that I've had to learn, mm-hmm. uh, patience and grit. Can you think of an example of a time where you felt like, okay, this is a really big obstacle that I don't know if I can overcome and like... I need to practice that grit <laughs> every day. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's uh, like you do get, I don't know if everyone do get tired of training, but I get tired of training sometimes because I've done it for such a long time. Mm-hmm. And um, like to find motivation is uh, sometimes not the easiest. Mm-hmm. But what I've learned most from or with the grit is... Um, um after i had this avalanche accident mm-hmm. i have not been so keen on or i wasn't so keen on skiing at all mm-hmm. that was a that's been a constant struggle the last like 4 years mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 5 years mm-hmm. since that avalanche accident to mm-hmm. actually 
um, go skiing. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't, like with that accident, I couldn't really let it uh, take over my life. So I just had to keep on pushing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, skiing for me these days, um, like I do all of these photo shoots mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, that could be even more challenging than to actually do, go and do a competition. Um, In what way? For me. So, yeah, so when you do photo shoots for, for ski brands, for example, for my sponsors, then you go out, you're maybe out for five or six days straight. One time I was in Russia for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And every day you're just trying to deliver and deliver and deliver in front of a camera, mm. which is not always super easy because it's snow and weather and, you know, all of that. Mm -hmm. So you can be on a shooting day, you're actually out from 7 to 7 or 7 to wow. 10 in the evening just to get the, or even, even earlier, like the sunrise, you need to, then you take a little break for lunch and, and if the conditions are good, then you can't stop. Mm -hmm. Like you don't eat, <laughs> you don't drink. Like there's, you have to, because snow, I mean, snow wise, if you have a good day, then you need to take advantage of that day mm -hmm. because the next day it could be raining. Mm -hmm. You have like no, uh, what do you call it? They're so small and it's so small. Yeah, the window the, is, is yeah. small, yeah. Mm. Huh. So those are actually even more, uh, yeah, challenging. Wow. Sometimes than just to go to a competition and stand on top of a mountain and <laughs> do a run one and... run. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Crazy. I never thought of it that way. That's so, I mean, just goes to show, you know, what you see on the picture is so not representative of the work and no, all this that goes. No, 100% not. Yeah. No. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Was there ever an instance when you were doing like a photo shoot that you also felt uncomfortable with what was asked of you? Or y Yeah. Like, Hundred percent. Okay. Many times it took me many years to learn to say no. It's um, you need to know um, you need to know yourself quite well and be able to stand up for your uh, mm. um, your wishes and feelings and uh, yeah, it took a while, and not because the photographers are asking you to do something that is not possible. It's just that maybe you're not on the um, on your best that day, or mm -hmm. you're you're feeling something that day that it's not it doesn't fit into that um, work that yeah. day, you know. So, can you share an example? Like, do you have something in your mind of? Mm, I mean, the Avi avalanche accident happened on the shooting day. Oh, what? Yeah. So that w that's uh, an example where I should have, um, I had a bad feeling and I was really tired. I think it was the third or fourth day of shooting and filming. I wanted to say that I wanted to go home, but it, that's not really an option. Not not only for like, for if I would have said that, ob obviously I would have gone home mm -hmm. and everyone would have said, yeah, go home. But it's not really an option for me either to go home on a working day. Mm -hmm. So... No, we went and we were going to boot up this little uh, thing and I really didn't want to. So I, I stalled a little bit and then um, this photographer said like, yeah, you have to walk after the guy who's walking. Like you have, we have to get up there because it was a stressful day. It was 50 centimeters of new powder, sunny. It was like the perfect day, but in Engelberg and there it's going to get skied out. So you have to be like on mm. your, on your mark and go. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, we had been shooting for like two or three hours already. Um, so I started booted. And then when me and him was always almost up, it was a very short boot, maybe 20 meters. Then uh, where we were standing broke. Um, and I got caught in it. Um, my friend was uh, only on top of it, so he was fine. But I was uh, buried one meter under. Cool. Um, yeah. They digged me out super fast because obviously some of the persons in the in the group they hadn't even been starting they didn't even start booting so they were just standing on the side and were totally ready to just mm. jump in and and rescue. So I wasn't under for long and everything was good, but for a long time I was like telling myself that it wasn't my 
I didn't make the decision and I should have said no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I didn't. Mm. And then there's been like a couple of other thing, like things where you're asked to do something and you don't feel totally comfortable like with glacier, like crevasses, mm-hmm. what do you call glacier? Yeah. yeah, it's the same in English, crevasse. Crevasse, okay, yeah. yeah. And um, there also it's like, okay, yeah, make two turns here, but you're not, like, you can't fall mm. because yeah. th- that could be super dangerous because you're doing two turns in between two crevasses so just don't do it and you'll die mm-hmm. and some of those times I froze and I did fall oh yeah oh, and then God. obviously when you're losing a ski between two crevasses oh. you're like I can't move like you know because oh. you can't move and you just get like okay yeah, I'm gonna get out of here <laughs> like but uh, and then I would also why didn't I just say no yeah. you know I've also had some fights with some photographers. Like, we're all friends now. Mm -hmm. But it took me a couple of years to learn that I could say no. And that's fine. Sometimes it's also not fine. And you will never work with that photographer again. But then you know. Wait, so you fell into a crevasse? or how? I didn't. Because I, I, uh, I was in between two. So if I would have fallen differently. But I didn't fall into it, no. Oh my gosh still that moment of like you know you're crashing and you know what's around you yeah and you just need to stop yeah and you also don't know what's under you because you're on a glacier so it could be anything (laughs) so stressful i fucking hate glaciers they are oh oh, they're so stressful when you know i wish i could go back to the time when i didn't know i if i if we can like um because last time you spoke about, obviously, this avalanche incident as being, mm-hmm. like, really traumatizing. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, yes, 100%, mm. obviously. Um, I, I'm i wondering if you could share, like, do you remember in those moments? Like, did time s- slow down? Kind of like you imagine in the movies, these kinds of things. Like, Yeah, um... Yeah, they do. I mean, the the problem with the, or problem, but the thing with the, that I know now with an avalanche is that you, you get buried and taken with, or you know you don't see anything because you're in snow, so you have no idea of where is up, where is down, um, where am I? You know how f- how far away am I? Um, like for instance, my my brain kind of shut off. Yeah. in the moment where I got swallowed and I remember just hearing someone like screaming super loud in panic just screaming and I just hear this and then I realize it's me <laughs> and then it's like fuck I need to stop screaming because I'm gonna use all the air so I need to fucking stop screaming and just like collect myself. I could obviously not move. Uh, my hand, the arms were, yeah, couldn't move. But I had a little pocket of air and was like, okay, so I need to get my shit together, stop screaming, and like save the air. And then I heard my uh, my friends. Uh, coming Mm -hmm. so I could I could hear like okay that's the probe they're probing Uh, I hear him up there it's fine yeah it's gonna take very short time and they're gonna get me out but so when you were like you're talking about you were hiking up Mm -hmm. um and then it was a boot boot hike yeah yeah. what like what do you know what triggered it or, or could you have reacted somehow or what what was like that moment or you heard kind of the you heard the woomph and yeah. then it's over there's no chance hmm. totally depends where you're standing or yeah but i've had like the two years after two or three years after that i couldn't boot hike yeah yeah there was no chance Crazy. like someone had to do the boot for me, I could never boot my own track. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, like, that would mm-hmm. be impossible. Mm-hmm. So I had to come over that and, like, get over that. And 
really work with a lot of things. But would it not have happened if you guys were on skis or what? Mm. Right there, there was no possibility to be on skis. Mm-hmm. Um, it would probably have happened. It was. It's the weight. Yeah. It depends on the weight. Yeah. That you put on the weak layer and how how weak that layer yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. And like, how long from, or do do the people you were with know? Like from that first woomph to you realize you're the one screaming and you realize you're buried like what's the timeline there it was only a couple of minutes yeah like not much at all i think they digged three minutes wow so wow. maybe it was a little bit more i don't know yeah yeah like mm-hmm. all in wow and you, and like did it pull you down very far or you know from that initial no just a couple of meters because just below us was a uh, cat track Uh, yeah. So I just stopped on that one yeah. and got filled. Yeah, there. My friend that was on top was carried like on the top for. So he didn't get buried, mm-hmm. but still got caught in or not in it, but like on top of it. Or... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Okay, crazy. And so, do you think you like blacked out during? Yeah, that's what my therapist thinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but me too. It's definitely black. Wow. And I've had a hard time to. Um, access that or I haven't been yeah. able to access that which is why then I got this PTSD it's, I got like some kind of a death anxiety yeah. from yeah. this that I've been working on or yeah. with yeah. since then and so it, it was like woomf, blackout you hear screaming, realize it's you and then what's and then I hear my uh, my friends and uh, I can feel that they're probing yeah. and finding me yeah but what's going through your head um like yeah just uh, try to use as little oxygen as you can you don't know how long you're going to be under so mm. just stay very calm i also thought about um a friend who passed just a year before in an avalanche and that it was kind of a relief to know that if the oxygen oxygen goes out i'm gonna pass out hmm. so i'm not gonna you know it's, you're not gonna die a very gruesome death you're obviously gonna pass out because your brain is gonna shut down when the oxygen is out so that's gonna happen first but your body is still gonna wow. you know so you're gonna pass out and it's gonna be very very um chill <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was <laughs> telling myself. <laughs> But obviously I heard them quite quickly. So yeah. I knew that I was going to be saved. Yeah. yeah. So it's just it was just a couple of seconds there when I uh, lost it. Yeah. Were your eyes open? Do you know? Yeah. So and could you, what did, can you see anything? Or like what is the, you see snow? Or yeah, you see snow. Yeah. So is it light or dark? It was uh, kind of light what I remember it. Yeah. Huh. Mm. And then when they um, were digging, like, which way were you facing in the snow? Did you... Um, so I was laying kind of sidewise, um, parallel to the ground, kind of. Mm. Um, so they, uh, I think they digged out my boot first, because that's what they were probing. Yeah. And then they got to my face, yeah. Okay, but so were you face up? Uh, like side, like oh, side. kind of okay. laying on the side, yeah. Oh, crazy. Yeah, with my arms like this yeah that was always something that like messed with my head when i thought about like you could be digging or trying to dig yourself out in some scenario and you're digging in the complete wrong yeah or would you be able to tell which like did you have any idea of where you were only by sound mm, yeah, yeah okay yeah that makes sense so i could hear them so yeah. i would obviously go in that direction uh, but okay. i mean your your arms are stuck crazy so you can't move like you have no chance of moving crazy If you haven't had like a very s- fast reaction to pulling your arms like together so that you can maybe do something like this. What? Yeah. And even then it's going to be so compact, right? Yeah. Like, no, you're... Oh, gosh. You're fucked. Probably. And then, so they 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 hit your boot or they start mm-hmm. at your feet and what happens the rest of this day? Oh, they were, they were digging and then... Uh, um, They found my face and they got me out and uh, 
um, I hugged all of them. They were all in a very bad state, as I was, because yeah. it's not something you're used to at all. <laughs> Maybe it happens one time in your life, and then you've been very unlucky yeah. for the whole team, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so uh, we uh, hugged. There was a friend of mine who was on the side. She was crying like a maniac. Uh, she had to come up with a lift, and it, this was just next to the piste, kind of. So she came over there, and um, then I started crying. And then uh, we uh, we didn't have any gear, me and this guy, because it was all buried. Wow. So then we had our we had down with the lift mm-hmm. and got a scooter and went home. Gosh, and like, and then I went to work. No, yeah, I did. Yeah, because I'm weird. The same day. Yeah, I started at four. Yeah, but I uh, the shock was uh, I hadn't realized it. I didn't realize that I had, that I had some kind of PTSD until um, like I try. I I was shooting that week. We did shoot. I did out skiing and shooting the next day and the day after, because I felt that if I didn't go up, mm-hmm. I was gonna have a problem. Mm-hmm. And then it was snowing so hard. Um, two days after on this shoot that and it was just wide out and that freaked me out and I got a really bad panic Whoa. attack in the um, only like in the bus on the way home because I couldn't con- it was like wobbling a bit on the new snow and like I couldn't handle it at all mm. and then I realized that something's not good but I kept on skiing that season um but didn't realize until the next season, the start of the next season, when I went for a shoot, that I couldn't ski outside of the piste. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I got so... Um, I got panic attacks. I would just cry under my goggles. I couldn't like, I couldn't get myself... I, I, I thought everything would go. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a realistic um, mm-hmm. idea of uh, anything. Mm-hmm. I had to start like fresh. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's mind-boggling to me that you could go, like, to work <laughs> that same day. I'm curious, like, when you went to bed that night, you could just, like, fall asleep as normal in the weeks that followed? That I don't I don't remember just that day. I remember when I came home, I actually called my father. Um, because he had the dementia at the time. Yeah. And I didn't really want to call my mom because she would tell me that I had to come home yeah. and never ski again. Yeah. So And my father had dementia, so I thought it's perfect. <laughs> I can call him and tell him what happened and he will forget it in 10 minutes. Yeah. So that was like my... I told some friends and then called my dad. And then I, yeah, went to work. But, um, I mean, that was obviously because I didn't know yeah. anything you know, at the time. I don't think my brain could handle it. But then I started to go to a psychologist in the autumn when I realized that I had a big problem. Um, but that's like months later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, many months. I didn't understand. I mean, it was very late in the season. It was yeah. 21st of April, yeah. I think. So it was very late in the season. So we were anyway stopped skiing. Mm-hmm. We, we would, yeah, mm-hmm. so we were mm-hmm. not skiing anymore. And uh, then the summer came and that was fine. Had some problems being in like gondolas with a lot of wind. Mm. I would get uh, panic attacks or mm. yeah, and that's when I realized that this is gonna mm-hmm. um, this is gonna impact my whole life. Mm-hmm. So I need to take care of it, like try to find a way. So it's not even just about um, avalanches anymore. It's any kind of situation maybe where your body reacts in a way. Yeah, I couldn't. Where there's like risk. Yeah, I couldn't handle it at all. But that's been like a constant thing that I've had to uh, re-expose myself to situations that I would normally don't care about or I, w- I wouldn't flinch to yeah. do one one thing or the other or like do those things. And then when this happened, I had to um, uh, redo everything. Hmm. Yeah. What about... Um like so that's one example of where you're you're physically in a situation but what about when you watch something or you hear about something um do you also have kind of a bit of a stress response to that yeah um 
I had for a while. I know my um, I had a lot of nightmares for the first like year. But were your so your nightmares were not about skiing necessarily. No, but a lot about being swallowed by waves or wow, yeah. things that I can't control. Yeah. But like, you know, you get that feeling sometimes when you're on the snow and you kind of get carried. It's not an avalanche, but the snow kind of carries you a little yeah. bit of away, right? You don't, it's not stable underneath your, or like mm. you slide with the snow. Yeah, slough. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember this feeling of? Not really. Yeah. No. But it was a very weird situation, obviously, because we were boot packing. It went super fast. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I think like your brain just shuts down, you know. Yeah. To. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's like that for everyone, obviously, who has been in such a um, situation. But for me, at least, yeah. Mm -hmm, Can't tell you anything mm -hmm. else than that. Yeah, because I, I get a lot of the time, like when I'm falling asleep at night, I like get these twitches in my legs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then in my head I'm already like slipping on ice or something mm. like this so like my brain tries to connect things with my body mm -hmm. um or you know if you're in the ocean and you feel the waves all day and then you go into bed and you feel the waves mm -hmm. and so I was kind of wondering if there was some kind of like because it was a physical event for you mm -hmm. if that somehow also translated into not really, but another very interesting thing that happened that uh, surprised me. I I got problems with my uh, 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 my blase. How do you call it? In Your bladder? Yeah, my yeah. bladder. So the anxiety transferred from my head and I wasn't scared. But I would get very... I really needed to pee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in very weird situations or mm -hmm. not even weird situations so I would like on a shoot I was there and mentally I was prepared to go and do the things that I should do mm -hmm. but I would have to go pee hmm. I would get I would need to pee so badly hmm. that it was like insane so the persons that I had been shooting with before or like my teammates or people I know they would be like why what is happening you were just at the toilet yeah and I'm like I don't know I just need to pee I didn't I didn't connect it mm. in the beginning mm -hmm. and um, then I realized that uh, it just it went yeah my anxiety was still in my body and mm. it was not resolved <laughs> it was very uncontrollable yeah I even peed my I also peed my pants <laughs> once on a shoot I didn't tell anyone. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that was the worst. It was like there was it was not controllable. It's happening now and I can't do anything <laughs> about it. And then we did one more run, you know, I was like oh, totally soaked and no, so cold. No. And then I had to go one more run on the like the gondola and like I was like shit, I hope I don't smell and then I went home and just had to put everything in the oh, washing no. machine. Yeah. Never told anyone. Some friends afterwards, but yeah. So you just like you you were too busy to go pee. Yeah, no, I or? yeah, but this was the thing that it was not controllable. Like okay, okay. I I went to the toilet and then we uh, went out. Yeah. Like 4 minutes later and then we we're out there and then we we're supposed to do something. Yeah. And it just Crazy. came again. It was like it was not there was not I couldn't control it. Huh. It was not possible. It was like the the pee just uh, <laughs> appeared from nowhere because I was just at the toilet. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if like regret is the right word, but you kind of talked about the way you thought about that day of how you weren't comfortable with doing something and did it and all these things. Like, do you ever think about uh, if things had been worse? Like if the outcome was not as, if we can say, positive... Um, yeah um obviously that has been uh the constant companion from then mm. to now that it can be so much worse mm. that situation couldn't have been that much worse because it was such a small avalanche mm -hmm. and like everything around it was very small it was like a test drive mm. kind of if you compare it to 
what normally kills people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I wasn't taken down a gully. I didn't like there was no rocks that I could have broken my neck on, which mm-hmm. is normally a thing that happens. But I mean in general, like I don't wanna say like a close encounter with death. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of like as close as we get without getting too close. Yeah, it was like know? a PG twelve what do you say, PG thirteen movie. Yeah. You yeah. know? It was like <laughs> yeah. just just on the edge there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And which ha- is amazing. How does that like make you think about death and life and I don't think about death that much. Actually. Like I did get death anxiety that I was gonna die. Yeah. But that was mostly a it was not like a a conscious decision. Mm. It was mostly that my body wouldn't serve me mm-hmm. in like yeah i would think that i would die but not really think it it was just i would feel like i would die mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. in different situations which was which worse because then you i could really not control it mm, mm. like obviously when i'm in a gondola and it's blowing too much and mm-hmm. it's starting to get super windy i know logically that it's going to be fine mm-hmm. because otherwise I wouldn't be in the gun. I wouldn't mm-hmm. be on, mm-hmm. you know, it wouldn't mm-hmm. go, but I couldn't body, body wise, I couldn't handle it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the feeling would be that I would die, but logically I knew I wouldn't, mm. which is, uh, has been, uh, so hard to try to control those different things mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. try to manage. Mm. Mm. But I mean, you can you you can die just walking on the street. I mean, that's yeah, that's what everyone says. That's like kind of the rationale for doing the things we want to do, right? Yeah. But um, I think it's a little bit different when you have that encounter. I mean, it's funny for me. Like, if we go to this gondola example, I would be the other way around, where I start to overthink things, mm-hmm. where it's like it starts off as a thought rather and then turns into uh, an experience Mm -hmm, I guess you mm -hmm, could say whereas mm -hmm. for you it's like a little bit the other way around yeah was there any way to come out of that like once once you had that feeling could you uh, there is one thing that my psychiatrist told me that has helped a lot when you're starting to get a panic attack then you send out this hormone but you and then you go like up 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 and it just gets worse and worse mm-hmm. and worse. But the body can only at one time send out as many. Mm-hmm. So there's like a limit of X of this hormone that the body sends out at a time. Mm-hmm. And then it's empty. Mm-hmm. So it the only thing that um, can make, make it spiral more, that it feels like it's going up, 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 it's never coming down. Mm-hmm. When you start to have to breathe, the, you know, those things, that's actually in your head. Mm-hmm. So... First, it's the body who sends okay. out this thing, but it's gonna take, it's gonna stop, mm. and from there, you can take control again. Okay. So that helped me quite a lot. So just counting to ten, when I feel that my body is sending out this, um, <laughs> this, uh, this substance, which makes me go into a, like a panic attack, mm-hmm. I know that it's just mm. the first reaction, and then I can myself mm. handle it. Mm. As long as I don't let it spiral. Hmm. So I just have to like count to 10 and like get it over with and we're fine. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, so that's the one of the things that I learned that I've used a lot. Hmm. Because obviously I was scared for every new run or every powder day or mm-hmm. people will be so excited about powder days. And I would just want to yeah. go to bed then you have to go out anyway which is good though okay so like let's imagine it's snowing and there's tons of fresh powder outside Mm -hmm. you feel in your body something like it doesn't feel good in your body or you think of it as like a risky situation and then it doesn't or what's the for many years it was uh, body Mm -hmm. anxiety now it's more logical and what is that process? Um, 
I needed to uh, take a lot of avalanche courses, um, work with my gear, learn as much as I could about snow, snow layers, weather reports, where to ski, where not to ski. Mm -hmm. How does it look like when it's a dangerous pocket or a trigger point? Mm -hmm. Like take, um, be 100% sure that you make your decisions as well as you can in where you should ski. Mm. But it was many years that I, I never skied with people I didn't trust. I walked away from groups. Um, I went home mm -hmm. if I felt that the pressure was too high or I didn't, yeah, just didn't. Mm -hmm. Like I, I had to exert. Mm, extract. Extract myself from the situations, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm. Actually, this winter that was the past winter was the first time that I thought it was fun again to ski. Wow. Yeah, it took five years. Wow. The rest has just been fucking grit. Hmm. Just to get over it. I didn't want it to take over. Yeah. So I had to just continue. How do you how do you know like in those moments that it is taking over? Like I don't feel like myself. Okay. It's not what I would have felt or done or mm. it's like another person and how do you the like kind of when you're when you're in that moment how do you recognize that um because it or for me it's been quite simple it's uh, it's been fear mm. and i'm not uh, very comfortable with letting fear mm. make my decisions or take my decisions for me mm -hmm. um i want it to be present but not take over. Yeah. And I, I think it's very easy to think that fear sometimes is the, you know, the little, oh, you shouldn't do that or you shouldn't, yeah, you should do that. But it can just be, it's just so limiting mm -hmm. because it's something that you've came up with yourself in a way. Mm. I don't know how to explain it. It's mm -hmm. just how I see it. Mm -hmm. It's um, when you're, obviously, if you're afraid of taking poison, Mm -hmm. This, I mean, it's gonna logically that's gonna have a a very bad response mm -hmm. to your life. Mm -hmm. um, so you shouldn't. That's why you. I mean, we have fear as a, a reaction to to keep us alive. Mm -hmm. But then there's fear that is not just holding you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I ask because I think we can go a long time not being ourselves or not feeling like ourselves without realizing that that's the case right because it be mm. maybe sometimes becomes like the new normal mm -hmm. and it's not until one moment or like there's maybe something that makes you realize or look in the mirror metaphorically speaking mm -hmm. and be like wait that's not who i am mm -hmm. or wait there is this fear mm -hmm. that's like covering me and not letting me live live mm -hmm. my life mm. and i think it's hard to see that sometimes. So I was wondering if, if there's something that helps you see that or a way that you can recognize me versus like fear me, you know? Yeah. Well, as I started, I, I stopped having for a while the goal to go to the to the world tour. I didn't think that I would be able to do that mm -hmm. for a while. And then I looked back at some, I looked like that was in the middle of it, maybe year three or something. I looked back at some interviews that I made during my first season or the second season. I uh, I read this article and I was like, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You know, like, mm. yeah, that's I mean, and if people ask me, like, yeah, are you going there? And then, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Mm. But right now mm. I really don't want to do it, mm. you know, and I have not made that decision mm. because I didn't make the decision that I don't want to compete on the world tour mm. or I haven't made decisions that I want to stop skiing mm -hmm. um, that's not me mm. because I would have to think about that for a long time mm. and not just from one day to the other mm. I don't want to ski you know what am I supposed to, what am I going to do then I have to have like a second plan mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that would be my normal mm -hmm. and now it was just that something in me didn't want to ski and I didn't decide it mm. it was not my decision it just didn't feel like my decision 
Hmm. But also, like, I wasn't so happy in that situation. And I know that I strive to be happy. So I can't have made that decision, Hmm. you know. Hmm. Even if it it was taking over my whole life, obviously. Hmm. Hmm. So how often would you think about those? Like, was that every day where you felt like you weren't able to live in a way that was like true to you or what was that what was that like no I think it mostly like crept up on me a little bit yeah I don't think I noticed I also didn't talk about it for many months I didn't tell my mother until like two years after whoa yeah she was so mad yeah I believe it Mm -hmm. she was not happy (laughs) oh gosh (laughs) and I and I had you know I had processed it for two years so I could then talk about it Like, you know, semi, you know, like a little bit, you know. And she was just, like, shocked. I think I said it when we had beers with my friends. Like, just as a funny story. Like, guess what? And she was like, what? Oh, no. Poor mom. Poor mom. Yeah, that's like her nightmare probably, too. 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's interesting that it hasn't uh, changed the way that you think about, like, life or death too much. Yeah, it's weird. I haven't I haven't even thought about that question until you asked me. Yeah. It hasn't that like my core beliefs, it hasn't changed that, which hmm. is good. Yeah. What do you think about like the sport in in general? I mean, it's not abnormal that people like that this risk is such a big part of the sport and that the community loses people mm-hmm. to those risks. Mm-hmm. And you said it before like yeah, you can like die walking on the street Mm -hmm. for me myself yeah i can as easily be hit by a car on the street because Mm -hmm. the aspect of such a scenario would be a little bit the same because also there i'm an adult i know if it's a street cars are coming from different sides i make an assumption that that it's safe Mm. to walk over a street Mm -hmm. and i can do the same for me right now in skiing Mm -hmm. with snow and everything and i also calculate uh, calculate the risk of like it could go Mm -hmm. like where should I ski what should I do Mm -hmm. Um, and I also know that it can happen Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I don't like about the free ride ski community is that so many don't know Mm. so they are actually not it's not for them on the mountain as it is for them on the street with um, getting hit by a car yeah I mean that's also mostly unlocked because there's a there's a, a second person involved that are not being very responsible mm-hmm. about something probably mm-hmm. someone is not being responsible yeah but on a mountain and with avalanche safety people are in, in quotation marks like they don't know yeah so they cannot take that mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. decision right that they can do on the street mm-hmm. Because they've been on streets since they were two, three years old and they've been told about the risks, about uh, yeah. the street and the cars since they were very, very young, maybe 15 years before they come up on snow. But avalanches, especially for like the Nordic persons who, who or Scandinavians, we don't have the same mm-hmm. amounts because it's not as steep and it's not the same snow layers and everything and not the same snow. We have no clue mm-hmm. about avalanche danger mm-hmm. or how to prevent it or how how to not get caught or stuff like that. So I don't I don't think that a person is coming out skiing and it's not if you're not skiing every day you don't know how the snow is like and how mm-hmm. it's been during the last couple of weeks or months. Mm-hmm. So you can't really take. If you don't have the knowledge, you can't make that yeah. risk assessment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, mm. So up on the mountain is for me quite a different topic. So it would be like, you can cross the street, but we're going to put a blindfold on you. Kind of. A little like bit. Like you have like one less piece of information. or Yeah. And probably there's also the idea that people think they know the amount they need to know. Mm-hmm. But relative to the actual situation, it's little. Yeah. I, so I there's one or it's maybe it was four or five persons that I trusted during my the my worst times to ski with, mm-hmm. like the only ones. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like I would not go somewhere I was not comfortable if, with if it wasn't with them. Mm-hmm. And those are like mountain guides who are up there almost every day and know the conditions and are studying it and been for a couple of years. Obviously, they also happen up in unlucky situations. Yeah. You can never calculate luck, you know, or unluck in mm-hmm. this situation. Mm-hmm. But and then there, there's other piece, people who are not, um, they're not uh, mountain guides, but they are on the mountain. Mm-hmm. So they've been skiing a lot of different aspects. They've mm-hmm. um, they've felt it, like yeah. how how it's been on the mountain and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Or they've read bulletins for a couple of days or they've really studied it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, those people I also trust because they have it kind of in their bodies. Think back to that day. I mean, you talked about, okay, you could have technically gone home, but you didn't really feel like it was a choice. What What were the forces on you that made it feel like it wasn't a choice Mm, I wanted to do a good job Hmm. like for for myself and to be able and capable of Hmm. doing that full day Hmm. I thought for a while when I was like straight after the the uh, accident and the, the the whole year after I felt a little bit like it was the the fault of the person who asked me to walk up that boot pack, a boot pack, mm-hmm. but realized quite um, afterwards that it was no one's fault than mine, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which was quite important to learn because you make your own decisions, mm-hmm. and that's the only thing that you can control. No one is uh, making you do anything. So when you say you wanted to do a good job, mm. like, it seems obvious, but why? Like, what did it mean for you at that time? Mm, like, to get noticed, to, like, to, for my career in skiing, mm-hmm. for my sponsors. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, for me as a skier to evolve, like, all of those things. I mean, that in... Uh, um, if you are or should ski or want to ski professional, then you have then that's the work. Yeah. yeah. And so, how is your perspective on that changed now? I'm assume you still want to do a good job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just make my own decisions hmm. and only work with um, photographers who listen and who I feel I can have a really good dialogue with. And hmm. um, I've fought with some of them. Mm-hmm. And then maybe we don't work for a while, but then we, then we do. Hmm. Like it's just yeah, standing your own ground and. What does that conversation look like? Like what? Why would a photographer? Why is there even a dialogue? You know, like what is the? What are the two sides of the story there? Mm, because you have like you want there's light and snow, hmm. and tracks, hmm. for the photographer, and then you need to have a a skier on top of something that has light and good snow Mm -hmm. and no tracks Mm -hmm. and um, uh, in those situations that you also need to look like how he's pointing the camera what is in the backgrounds uh, does he have to do it the other way around Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of things where you have to you have to kind of ask the photographer like where do you want me to ski Mm -hmm. and they will give if you're a team you'll give you a couple options like Mm -hmm. you can ski there you can do that I, I see this picture I see this picture and then you try to as a skier to do that as uh, good as possible Mm -hmm. uh, from his like Mm -hmm. uh, what he's seeing so the dialogue is he will say that looks like a really cool photo can you do that Mm -hmm. and then you'll say yeah or as I did for many years no Mm -hmm. (laughs) someone else have to do it like if we're three skiers on one photographer then I'll just give it to the next person Mm -hmm. Or like, yeah. And um, then that person will probably do it. But isn't there then a lot of pressure? Like, I don't know, you don't... I, I would think it's like competitive where you don't want other people to have the shot that could be your shot. Yeah, but you normally then... If you're a good team that work well together, then you normally take turns. Hmm. 
So and also we have different strengths. So right. then, if um, person A is good at that, then mm-hmm. that that person will get those shots. Like, mm. and obviously the persons who are best at getting really good shots, and if it's a very important photo, then that person mm-hmm. will go for. It's a, for me, it's a very simple hi- hierarchy. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, you never feel bad about it, like, I mean, I, th- I think it takes a lot to to say when someone says, can you do it, that you say, no, but this guy's better than me, this girl's better than me, she can do it, right? Like, that's that's quite, I don't know, I feel like that takes a lot to, to do that, no? Maybe, I don't know, not not for me anymore, no. Crazy, yeah. But it's also, like, super important then, because I also had this season when I would give away all of the shots. Hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, and I realized, like, if I don't take space... Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get any. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you're shooting with uh, two or three other really great skiers. Yeah. Mostly boys. Yeah. And they would be like, yeah, I'll do that. And I'll do that. and Or this. And look at that. And then... But this takes like quite a long time to learn how to do these shoots mm-hmm. and to take space. Yeah. yeah. Um, because when you're... If you're... Uh, I've, I've learned that from... <laughs> yeah, the my own experience of not getting any shots uh, which was definitely my own fault but um, the other persons in the groups obviously also want to have the shot yeah 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 but if you have a good like group dynamic and yeah. you're good friends then no one will deny you the shot you know crazy but that's also out of your control sometimes right like you don't always get to choose the group of people like if it was you and three other girls all the time and you were all kind of at the same stage in your careers and wanting mm. to like develop and be on the scene, mm-hmm. then it could maybe, I don't know, be more kind of tense, no? Yeah, if you don't follow the rules of like one, two, three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So okay. then you just make turns. But that's also to, also why many photographers have um, athletes Yeah. that they always work with. Okay. Like you always work with the same ones. Huh. Yeah, new group dynamics is hard, but also then for me the hierarchy is that the best skier hmm. will get the best shots mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because maybe I will fuck it up because I I'm not as able right, or capable. Right. Yeah. Then it's better for us as a group mm-hmm. that we get that shot. Right. Then for me to go and fuck it up or you know, hmm. if I'm not sure, I'm probably I'm gonna fuck it up. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, like I did between those crevasses yeah. <laughs> that we talked about. <laughs> like if I'm not sure that I want to do this, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. But I've learned that from mistakes, obviously. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. But do you get paid like either way? Do you just get paid per day, or like how does that work? It depends what kind of shoot it is, mm. but uh, sometimes per day, and sometimes you get the content from the photographers, and you can use it for yourself. Mm. Um. I mean, sometimes you do it only for your sponsors, so you're getting kind of paid either from them per day or you've gotten stuff and you have that in the contract mm. and you have to do a couple of shoots per year or okay but then that would take some of the pressure off as well right if like if you were only getting paid per shot or something like yeah, this no. that would be like really intense yeah and that also wouldn't work because it's not possible yeah 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 okay Crazy. then you have in some contracts that you get like bonuses if you have a cover or mm. stuff like that do you already have like stuff planned for this upcoming season or what is that outlook for you now? Not really. No. Like in Engenberg it's quite easy. People are coming and going and photographers are coming and going and then sometimes you have like I for instance have like loose talks with some of the photographers. Mm-hmm. In the beginning of the season like what are your plans? What are you going to do? Uh, is there space for me on any of those or yeah. they ask you do you want to come to this trip and do this? Uh, article with me or something like that okay yeah Mm. yeah i did i did have a setback that i didn't tell you about which has made this year quite unclear for me um as a skier as a person in general um we had this competition uh it's okay but we have time right yeah yeah so we had this competition the last competition of the year this year was in Verbier we were supposed to ski the Becteros, mm, which is the 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 final phase for the pro skiers mm-hmm. that they normally do, and they had been there two weeks before, but or one week before and cancelled mm-hmm. because it was too dangerous, uh, Abby safety dangerous. Oh, yeah. Mm. 
and then we came a week after and was supposed to and we we got this extra competition because the season had been so bad and we had no snow where we should have done competitions kind of like that so they tried to find a venue for us we did actually the FIBA run so we did compete on the pro phase also in Austria Mm. and then now we were gonna compete on another world tour um, so the higher level phase which we had never done before and we came there and it was yeah looked a bit sketchy like you had to think about what kind of line you were gonna do because you didn't want to release any pockets or Mm -hmm. like you had to think a little bit Mm -hmm. uh, about your line choice uh, more than usually uh, because it hadn't been skied for a while so it's like I was actually one of the first women to start Mm -hmm. so then obviously it's a yeah yeah it's wide open for anything can happen because I'm gonna be the first um but then, um, so we were going to go there. So we were up early in the morning and uh, we're going to this phase. And to get to the phase, we had to go a little bit around uh, a traverse down and then boot, pi- uh, boot pack a little bit and then boot pack on a ridge mm-hmm. to get up to the mm-hmm. starting point. And when we're traversing this first part, I think I'm probably the second or third or fourth girl. We are like a couple of people going and we go and everything's fine and then I get down to this part where we're gonna do the boot pack and me and the other girl are starting to put like you know your skis on our backs and yeah. stuff like that and then we hear this noise and there's an avalanche coming down just from where we've been Whoa. so where we have just traversed yeah. there's an avalanche coming down so we are um six girls there um, because the girls start, started first this time. So we were snowboard girls and, and ski girls, but now we were just six ski girls. And we see this happening, and we're like, oh shit, that's an avalanche. Like, And we just skied there, like, mm-hmm. I wonder what released. And then we hear screams. So then we realize that there's something in it, someone in it. Oh my God. So she's screaming like, help, 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 and she's on the bottom. Uh, it's probably 200 meters long that they've traveled yeah. in the avalanche and they're down on the bottom. So um, we just scream to each other like we have to call emergency. So we tried to call. We had no reception. Oh. Um, we had uh, one of the crew members of the competition uh, there, but he was he was just a filmer. So he didn't even have any equipment with him. Yeah. He just had the film pack. But he had the radio. Mm. So then we just, like, all of us just screamed, like, we have to go, we have to go. So they started, uh, two of the girls went directly because they had just come down. So they still had their skis yeah. on. So they went directly over. Then the other um, uh, other two girls put their skis on, went over. Me and the girl without skis, with skis on our backpacks, we started to preparing to go, like, to take our skis to go there. And, to go and help the yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah, the girl. And then... Um, uh, I tried to uh, localize or uh, find, uh, since I didn't have any reception, we tried to um, communicate via his radio. Mm. But they only spoke French, I didn't speak French, so he had to speak with the... Because we needed help, like yeah. obviously we yeah. didn't know what was happening, so we need to call help, that's the first thing you do. And then uh, he said that he would take over the radio, so I went over there, so I was last over. And when we're there... Two of the girls had started to search up and uh, uh, one girl wa- was underneath and one was half buried. So it was two buried. Oh God, yeah. yeah, and they were uh, also competing, but two snowboarders. Mm-hmm. So we had to just dig them up and I tried to search. I, I totally panicked. Um, I didn't even, like I, I almost couldn't function. Mm-hmm. I functioned and did okay, but mm-hmm. um, didn't trust my abilities to to search. So I tried to search, and yeah. So but she was digged up by two girls, the one that was underneath, and we searched the other areas to see if anyone else was in it. Mm-hmm. And then we got help from um, two persons from the staff of the competition, two. They came up, or what? How did they get or there? Or down. Oh, okay. Yeah. So from the ridge, they came okay. down. Yeah. But, I mean, it's a competition. It should be, like, 30 people there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And then um, we try to contact like the competition in the WhatsApp. Like, the, can we just get a head count? Are we searching for someone else? Is, is it someone that we don't uh, find that doesn't have a transceiver yeah, on? Yeah. Or can someone just give us a head count because we're losing time? Yeah. But we got this girl up um, within maybe seven minutes. Oh. So she was fine. Yeah. But the only reason we were that fast is because we saw her snowboard. Yeah. It was sticking out, but her head was yeah. in the bottom. And then, yeah, all of this happened and uh, we got flown out and they got flown to the hospital and obviously the competition was cancelled. And then we had this uh, crisis meeting or what do you call it Mm -hmm. with the competition lead or like the, the, uh, yeah, this uh, qualifier staff and when we came to this meeting, we thought that us girls was supposed to talk together about what happened because we were obviously in shock. Yeah. The ones who had helped, like, badly in shock. And that didn't happen. They they invited everyone because obviously we didn't know what was going to happen with the competition. Hmm. So everyone was there. Uh. And there was this discussion about not like, oh my God, we saved two persons today. Hmm. Uh, which one of them was actually had a broken back. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, Crazy. Yeah. And um, one, you wouldn't, yeah, if we wouldn't have been that fast, and the girls who were digging, if they wouldn't have been that fast, it would have been yeah. game over. Yeah. And on this meeting, uh, this... Um, uh, head of the organization he's just saying like yeah but you have to get used to that these things happen in these environments and stuff like that and I got very upset yeah. uh, with him and also with the whole how they are handling this situation because we are in shock mm-hmm. and they were just talking about the next competition yeah, which yeah. was going to be the next day yeah. and it was not going to be an option mm-hmm. like we had to compete the next day mm. And obviously all of us need to compete because that was the last competition for the season. So for the rankings, mm. if we will fall out, mm. I mean, yeah. So we had to compete the next day. Mm. Those two days was very exhausting. Mm. And also like, I wasn't sure like what had happened. I didn't really process we tried to process with each other like the girls and everything but um i had my first panic attack the next day after the Mm -hmm. competition i did good in the competition i did my my best result that season Hmm. probably because i i don't know how but managed to shut it out somehow yeah or was still in shock Mm -hmm. who knows but after that i got like my first really bad panic attack since like years yeah and the whole feeling of that meeting and how we were talking about this incident as if it's something that we should get used to. Mm. I'm not really behind that Mm. thinking, you know? And I wasn't in that... Since then, I've been struggling with this idea of that I have to get used to this Mm -hmm. like is this is it worth it is it not worth it why am I skiing like Mm. before I felt that all of the competition has been my safe space it's not anymore and how am I gonna deal with that Mm. which has made it's made it really hard to motivate myself for this year Mm. um I know I'm gonna compete it's not like an option for me really personally but it is a struggle to find the motivation there yeah I mean it does sound surprising that like that event being as significant as it was wasn't like adequately acknowledged or at all created space for you guys to process it or discuss it or at Mm. least have your kind of voice be heard no they just listened to the guy who came there like after us and yeah Yeah, I didn't feel that we were heard. Crazy. Did anyone like address that later on or with the... Yeah, we were discussing a lot in our group. Yeah. Yeah. Like the girls are obviously struggling. Yeah. The girls who are under. Yeah. Like why do you think that is that it wasn't 
Like, are they under a lot of pressure to just bang out events or? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. He yeah. actually was on this meeting. He was talking about how much they cost. Yeah, like yeah. he was talking about the price of yeah. the events. Yeah. Yeah. Which I am not comfortable with putting in relation with price of human life. Yeah, of course. So mm, I know that this person needs to do um, the job that he's meant to do. Mm -hmm. And that means yeah. budgeting and prices and everything. But in that forum, it was a little bit interesting take mm -hmm, mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. how we're going to go forward. And I know that like the show must go on. Mm. But... I'm not sure if I'm there for that. Right, but must it go on if that's like the future? You know, like at, how much further does it need to go? Like how, if those girls didn't survive, would it still be the set? Like, you know, where do you draw the line? Yeah, exactly. And that's what I mean. Like now, yeah. I, it didn't feel like they were acknowledging that we saved their lives. Yeah. Yeah. They were not like they were they didn't understand that she was totally burnt. He said like it, they also didn't listen to us obviously on, on what happened, but he said on this meeting that yeah, but you 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 found them. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And he and he thought that they weren't buried or blah blah. So yeah. There was obviously a, a bad communication on their part. Um hmm. But I mean, all of us, it could easily have been me. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. there two minutes before on the same face mm -hmm. and it broke for them, but not for me, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you had such an interesting conversation with these kinds of sports. As, as sport is professionalized across all different types of sport, right? Mm -hmm. Where the risk goes up, but there's also like financial incentives. Yeah, yeah. And like finding a balance Yeah. Definitely. between that and... and and taking risks and um yeah yeah it's like where where will it stop yeah. you know i mean yeah i mean on our level which is not the top level i think it should have stopped there yeah yeah uh just to make a stand in like yeah take care of each other and you know learn about avi safety this is a very serious mm -hmm. uh, thing that's happened and yeah yeah because like i if, mean the young they're young yeah yeah that's what i mean when we we're talking before about awareness of risk and these kinds of things of crossing the street and there's people kind of like you who have this now like increased appreciation for what it takes to be aware mm -hmm. mm. um and then there's people in that same community or same world that don't recognize it as such, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're forced to be in that community, or not forced, but like, if you want to do your sport on this professional level, you have to play within those rules, but those rules maybe deny that level of risk mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's like such an interesting, um, yeah, like tight spot to to be in mm -hmm. yeah well side notes <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. drop that one in yeah sorry no it's super fascinating and i think like from an ethical standpoint it's super interesting i mean in alpine skiing it's same thing or not same thing but like i always think about the fact that so much money gets invested into these events like these mm -hmm. world cups mm -hmm. bad visibility and they have to make a call whether to cancel it or not yeah But depending I've, on the safety of yeah, the athletes yeah but there it sounds like the athletes have also a lot more because the athletes can also decide right yeah and is that you guys don't have that or no and we're a little bit more yeah i think the athletes on that level can decide because they know it's not going to be good for them because they are so experienced mm. but in our group we yeah. have skiers from like 19 years of old uh, of age until yeah. 35 yeah. which means that probably the 30 mm -hmm. will know there's a next season mm -hmm. but the 19s yeah they are not there yet yeah um so they would want to go right or they don't see the risks as you see them yeah, yeah. exactly which is super fine mm. uh, because they probably yeah they'll be fine but 
they will also not vote to not have a competition. That's what I'm yeah, yeah. But so you have people who vote who maybe don't have all the information that yeah. they would need to vote. And at the same time, they also have pressure yeah. to yeah. compete. Yeah. Or they think this is my chance or yeah. whatever. So yeah. then they make like decisions that aren't really logical mm -hmm. or they're, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It is how it is. <laughs> it is how it is. Yeah. Um, oh, I realized I forgot to ask you this last time. Mm -hmm. I try to like start a tradition um, as a final question mm -hmm. to go with the theme of, of things that are steep. Mm -hmm. The question is, would you rather go up something that is steep or go down? Down. And why? <laughs> up is just like you have no idea what's happening and down then you can control it a little bit better or you can ski away from it if something happens. Wow, very specific to this like conversation that we had, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, it yeah, it has changed my way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah I would never want to. I hate going up. Crazy. Not because it's hard or heavy or anything. It's just that I can't control it, Less and control. I, I can't. Yeah. Wow, what a unique perspective. I think most people don't think of it that way. So that's really cool. If I would climb rope. Yeah. Yeah. Then. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Up is okay. Yeah. But I'd rather go down. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here and stoked for the season. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay, ciao. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao. ciao.